Good afternoon. Matt, you want to start us off? Sure. I don't want to interrupt the email you're typing, so we can we can pause for a second. If you, somebody else needs to take a phone call anyway, so should we just <laughs> should I go should I exit and come back in in five minutes? Um, um, just really uh, briefly, although I suspect there'll be other questions about this, but for me, just I'm um, going back to the conversation that we had yesterday or the the Q and A session from yesterday on the letter to the Israelis. Um, it, there seems to be some confusion about what the warning or what the message to Israel is. And a lot of people have taken the view or have interpreted it as you are threatening an, a quote unquote arms embargo on Israel. Now, maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, um, but my impression was that's not what is being um, threatened here or being discussed. So we, our commitment to Israel's security and to the defense of Israel is ironclad. That will not change. Um, as the letter makes clear, there are implications under U.S. law um, to, the, to the delivery of humanitarian assistance and Israel doing everything that it can to ensure that d the delivery of humanitarian assistance is not impeded. And uh, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals, but it does make clear that there are implications under U.S. law. But our hope is that Israel will take the steps that we yeah, outlined. No, I, I get that, and that's what you said yesterday. But the thing is, is that the letter talks about additional FMF, foreign military financing. Um, as you are well aware, there is a 10-year MOU with Israel that is already on the books that you are obligated to provide Israel with $3.3 billion a year uh, on, uh, in FMF, on top, and then another $500 million a year until 2028. Uh, for missile defense programs. When the letter talks about additional FFF, does it not mean on top of what you have already committed to? Uh, I don't want to get into parsing the letter in any further detail. As I said yesterday, we intended this to be a private diplomatic conversation, yeah, well, not, some, uh, not something that we discussed publicly. We're going to have the conversations about the full implications of the letter privately with the government of Israel, but I think I don't want to go beyond that publicly at this point. Yeah, but additional FMF, that does not include FMF that is already in the MOU that you have already committed to, and in which, in, in some cases ha, the, ha, has already been spent, we even are, post-2025 or 2026, whatever. We are going to follow our ob obligations under the law and beyond that. I don't, as I said, I don't want to try to well, I'm not parse. sure I understand I, what your obligations are under the law, and it sounds like you you might not either. Uh, I do I do fully understand. We're going to have okay. a good so – we're going to have additional FMF so mean money on the, top of the $3.3 billion a year? Uh, as I said, billion a year. this is not a letter that we intended to make yeah. public. We intended to discuss public. I understand it is public, and so it is very fair for you to ask questions about it. Um, but when it comes to those implications, we're going to have those conversations privately with the government of Israel and we hope ultimately that this is all hypothetical because Fine. we hope ultimately the um, government of Israel implements the steps that we outlined and there are no further implications right but further implications you can't even say speak to what one implication I can't speak be. to them here in this setting and uh, okay so if we drag you outside and <laughs> off, off camera, you'll be if you, able to speak if to you, uh, If you join the government of Israel, I'm happy to have a conversation with you about the, the intent of that letter. We'll no, be fully mean by it, but I don't think that's, obviously that's not a step that's going to happen. No, that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious, Matt, here. The, no, I, the, we, I get we it, did, but I'm being serious, too, because yeah. there, are, there's a, you know, there are people up on the hill who are outraged and like demanding that this be rescinded or demanding that you show proof of any potential violation of international humanitarian law or any hindrance of, of U.S. assistance getting in um, and, and calling this a threat of an arms embargo. And if that's not correct, they should be disabused of that notion because regardless of what you say about the timing of the letter, we're in the run-up to an election. So I think, you know, people should know what, you know, what it is that's at stake here. Is it additional, like on top of what's in already in the MOU, the MOU, which runs until 2028, or does it include 
so, stuff that's in the MOU. So first of all, people on the Hill say all kinds of things, um, not, all of which we, not all of which we but respond to. It's become a political Look, I, I'm, uh, thing. I, it has become a political thing, but that's always the case with this right. time of matter. I'm not going to yeah. get it. What, what I'll say is, look, we do have an obligation under the law to ensure that Israel has a qualitative military edge. We have an obligation under the law to um, uh, continue to comply with the obligations of the MOU. We also have an, uh, an obligation under the law to ensure that Israel complies with all elements okay. of U.S. law when it comes so to the use of, our, of, our, of security assistance you, that we provide. How you, you're saying then that you have not yet figured out how you might reconcile the two obligations, the qualitative military edge and the MOU I, I'm saying we, with the, um, we are, the additional FMF. We are not at a point today where we have to make that judgment, and we hope that we never get to that point. Right. Okay. Um, hold on. I just yeah. I want to go just to, to, to Lebanon for a second, because there was this footage that uh, appeared, I guess overnight, of Israel blowing up an entire village in, in, in southern Lebanon. Um, what, what do you make of that? So I've seen the footage. Um, I cannot speak to what their intent was or what they were trying to accomplish, um, what their targets were. I don't know what they were. Obviously, we do not want to see entire villages destroyed. We don't want to see civilian homes destroyed. We don't want to see uh, civilian buildings destroyed. We understand that Hezbollah does operate at times from underneath civilian homes, inside civilian homes. We've seen footage that has emerged over the course of the past two weeks of rockets and other military uh, weapons held in civilian homes. So Israel does have a right to go after those legitimate targets, but they need to do so in a way that protects civilian infrastructure, protects civilians. All right, I'm not sure I understand. What you, I, I cannot speak to the in, what their intent was or what they were trying to accomplish. Isn't it pretty clear that they what so, what they were what their intent was and so, what their, so whether they had a specific target in mind or not? Blowing up an entire village that seems to be pretty self. So I don't. I don't know what was in those buildings. I don't know what was potentially underneath those buildings. That's when I say I can't speak to what they were trying to accomplish. Well, have you asked? We have been in contact with them about this in, in, in uh, this uh, very incident. I don't have a report back. Has, to sh I don't have a report back to share today, but I we have been in contact with them about this incident. Well, okay, maybe not a report, but what did they, what what did they say? Did they say, "Yeah, we're looking into it," or did they say, "No, we did it and we're"? I don't have a, I don't I don't have a readout. Of the, I don't have a readout of those conversations. Yet. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just on the letter, have you seen any improvement in aid flow to Gaza since it was sent on Sunday? Uh, we have seen some improvement um, in the last few days. So a few things that we have seen the government of Israel do. Number one, we've seen them reopen the route from Jordan, where by the Jordan military delivers humanitarian assistance directly to the north of Gaza. Uh, Fifty trucks with food, water, and other humanitarian goods went in over that route yesterday. <laughs> We have seen them reopen the Erez crossing in the north. We have seen them open a new access route from southern Gaza to northern Gaza to make sure aid can uh, that is coming in through Karim Shalom can make it to the north. We've seen them open a new route for delivery inside southern Gaza. So again, aid that comes through Karim Shalom that then gets delivered through southern Gaza. We have seen them uh, take steps to approve new warehouses and other staging facilities for the United Nations and other humanitarian organizations to ease some of the logistical burdens that they have faced in, in storing and then delivering uh, assistance inside Gaza. Um, and it's our understanding that they informed the United Nations and other humanitarian organizations in the past uh, 24 hours or so that they are going to waive the customs declarations that they were requiring individuals to sign to bring goods in. They're going to waive them for 12 months, which is an important step that the humanitarian organizations have called on to be taken and something that was included in, in the secretary's letter. So um, we have seen, seen them taking initial steps over the past several days, but of course the proof will be in the pudding ultimately, and we want to see them take additional steps and we want to see ultimately the results change and the results will be more trucks coming in, more food getting in, more water getting in, and uh, civilians having the, the, the basic needs uh, that they require to uh, go about their daily lives. Okay, thanks. And then just on this strike on Nefatia, um that killed 16 people, including the mayor, uh, the caretaker prime minister said Israel intentionally targeted a meeting of the munip municipal council sorry, to discuss the city's service and relief situation to aid people displaced by the Israeli campaign. 
What's the administration's understanding on that? And do you find it acceptable to strike such a meeting coordinating uh, so aid? So I, I can't speak to the strike. I don't know what it is that they, that they were targeting. I would d direct you to them to speak to it. Would you find it acceptable to strike a meeting that was coordinated? So if aid? they were targeting uh, civilians, obviously that would not be acceptable. I don't know that that's what they were do they're doing, which is why I can't comment on this strike, because I don't know what their intent was, um, what they were trying to accomplish, and ultimately what they did accomplish. But obviously, if it was a meeting of civilians to coordinate aid and they were intentionally targeting that, of course that would be unacceptable, but that is the type of thing we'd want to see verified. Okay. There have been several strikes, obviously, you know, there's the village of Kana, which the, the whole village was just about destroyed, and there's Nabatia here, where they killed the mayor uh, during this meeting. And, and so I, I have a hard time understanding why you can't comment. I mean, you, you told them yesterday, well, yesterday was specifically on Beirut, uh, when, by the way, today they bombed a place in southern so i mean you know sometimes you say you can you can comment other times you don't want to comment i mean where are you here so i can comment on an overall policy and i can comment on a specific strike when we have verifiable information about what it is that happened what they were trying to accomplish whether they made a mistake or not whether they were they uh, accomplished their objective whether their objective was a legitimate one and obviously that varies from strike to strike. There are times, for example, with the World Central Kitchen strike, where we know obviously that they were striking civilian humanitarian workers, and it's very clear that something went terribly wrong. There are other instances where they strike a site where there are terrorists who are embedded there and there's, there's civilian harm, and you have to ask questions about how that happened, whether they knew what they were doing, and then there are other strikes um, uh, where the picture can be very mixed. So that's why it's always difficult to to comment on, on individual strikes when, you are in the fog of war and don't have always complete information. I can tell you as, as, as a general principle, of course we want to see civilians protected and we want to see Israel do everything within its power to minimize civilian harm. That applies to Gaza, it applies to, to um, uh, the war against Hezbollah as well. But it's specifically on the strike this morning in, uh, or today in uh, southern Beirut. Yesterday you said, you know, you're opposed to bombing general bombing or massive bombing or what have you in there today they struck the target in southern group so they do okay with that or so they do have the right to to target members of hezbollah they have the right to target terrorists who are committed to the destruction of israel who are committed to uh death uh to murdering civilians what I made clear yesterday, what you have heard us say, is that we are opposed to the bombing campaign in the way that we saw it proceeding over the past few weeks. We are opposed to the near daily strikes, and sometimes daily strikes, and sometimes multiple strikes a day in densely populated areas in Beirut. That's what we saw for a course of 10 days to two weeks, and we made clear to the government of Israel that we were opposed to that intense daily bombardment of Beirut, and we saw it dialed back significantly. It's not to say that there can't be some strikes that are, that are legitimate, but the type of bombing that we saw happening day in, day out in Beirut uh, that was causing civilian harm, that was causing mass civilian displacement, that was destabilizing to populations inside Lebanon is something we were clearly opposed to and we made clear to them. Yeah, but you made that clear several days after, after it, it, it you know, got reduced. Or you didn't say it during the, when it was happening. You weren't saying that. Uh, we made it. We did make it clear to them privately while it was happening, and we saw a change in behavior after we made it clear. I will, there is some. I, 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 sometimes we say this to you, and I don't think you don't believe us that we tell them things privately. This is an example. We told them privately uh, this at a point last week, well before we said it publicly. We made clear we wanted to see a change in behavior. We did see a change in behavior. It's not to make any predictions about uh, what they will do uh, in the future. They're a sovereign country that make their own decisions, but we made clear to them that we oppose the campaign that they were conducting, and we've seen it scaled back significantly. Can I just yeah. have a I'll come to you next, the, Eva. Um, connected to the aid letter, um, we uh, were told by UNRWA at, at CBS, we were told that uh, we're on track to another man-made disaster in Gaza. Go figure. Um, there, they assess, UNRWA assesses that food deliveries have been continuously declining since May. The Biden administration's NSM report came out at the end of May. Um, UNRWA assesses that one million people didn't get food in August, and now the figure is around 1.4 million not getting food. Does this is this a timeline that the State Department is also tracking in terms of food aid declining? and not reaching that number of people since May? I can't speak to their numbers. I haven't seen that report. Um, uh, and those are their numbers, not ours. But we have seen 
the situation get incredibly serious and incredibly dire. And that's why we have been engaging with them to make clear that there needed to be a change in behavior, there needed to be a turnaround. And when we didn't see sufficient results, it's why the two secretaries sent this letter that they sent on Sunday. Now, over the past few days, as I said, we've seen some initial positive steps. We need to see much more done uh, on the ground to make sure that people get the food, water, medicine, and other goods that, that, that they need to get. These initial steps have been important. They are not at all sufficient uh, in any way to address the very serious humanitarian needs on the ground inside Gaza. What, so I'm, I'm asking in the sense that if you had been tracking that, um, is, there, is it possible that at some point the department could have and the administration could have reopened the assessment of whether Israel is restricting aid getting in or not. And I know you talk about like it being a problem with Hamas taking the aid inside the Strip and that's also affecting people getting it. But was there at any point, um, a, did at any point the administration look at reopening that assessment early? I know you have to do it again in May, but. No, it's, so, so it's not a question of reopening the assessment or not. We have to make a report again to Congress in May. Our assessment has been ongoing. Um, and that's what we made clear when we rele released the report is that the report that we, right, you have to release the report at a snapshot in time that is mandated by National Security Memo 20. And the judgment that we made in that report was a judgment about where things stood when we released the report. And we made clear in releasing that report that our assessment would be ongoing. We weren't going to, we weren't going to make, we'd wait until May to issue a report again, but we weren't going to wait until May to, to make further assessments. They have been ongoing, and it is, it is our ongoing assessment of the declining levels of humanitarian assistance that led us to um, step up our interventions with the government of Israel that ultimately got us to where we were when we sent this letter. But if this assessment is ongoing, do, does this department at least have an idea of how many people were not getting any food in I, August, for uh, example? I, I don't. I can tell you that if you just look at the level of humanitarian assistance coming in, the level had declined dramatically. And the level in September was the lowest it had been in the past year. And so that levels were down window by 50%. are we talking about here in so September? Because I, we saw those new customs rules introduced by Israel. So are we talking about September, October, that this is become... They had declined dramatically in September, and they had gone down even more in October. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I told Hiva I'd come to her next. Yes. Sorry. Thank you a lot. Uh, I want to follow up on that strike in southern Beirut today. Matt, there, was, there has been a pattern since October 8th that the day you say something, that you oppose something, the Israeli do something totally the opposite the second day. What happened yesterday, or the, the, the last 48 hours, the prime minister, the Lebanese prime minister, said we have guarantees that they won't, they will not strike Beirut anymore. And obviously he was, this was the message in Lebanon, that these guarantees, the U.S. gave these guarantees. You said that yesterday, that you opposed these strikes on Beirut. Kirby, I think, in his briefing said that. I mean, does that concern you? This is the U.S. credibility. I'm not talking about whether this strike was against Hezbollah or against the, 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 the messaging, your credibility, the U.S. as a mediator, especially now in Lebanon, because everybody is looking at you, at you can you are the one who can pose a ceasefire at least. What concerns us ultimately is outcomes. And we involve the United States in trying to generate the best possible outcome in every situation. And so when you say we made this clear yesterday, I can tell you we made it clear some number of days before I stood here at this podium and said it yesterday. And it wasn't me saying at this podium that ultimately led to the intensity of the strikes in Beirut going down, it was our direct quiet intervention with the government of Israel uh, that I believe led to that, the intensity of that campaign being dialed back. We are going to continue to make that clear to the government of Israel, just as we're going to continue to make clear to them that ultimately we want to see full implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701. That includes the IDF withdrawing back into the borders of Israel and includes Hezbollah withdrawing back above the Latani River. That is what we continue to drive for. And it is ultimately those outcomes that we're most interested in achieving. On the strike in the south today, the village, the destruction of an entire village, also the strike in Nabatiyi. By the way, the building was belongs to the, uh, I think, the interior ministry, because this is a municipality. Also, you said you support a, military, a limited military operation. Is there a shared 
definition for this military limited military operation between you and the Israeli? Because I think the understanding in Lebanon that they, what, what's happening now, it's like a scorched earth policy to create a safe zone in the south. So it seems, and it seems to be in effect now. And do you support that, that this will support the Israeli later in their negotiations with uh, Hezbollah or with the Lebanese government? So. so what we support are limited incursions to attack and degrade, to attack Hezbollah, to degrade Hezbollah infrastructure, not to target civilians, not to uh, destroy civilian ho homes, not to wipe villages out. We do support um, uh, campaigns to take on Hezbollah because for the past year, we've seen Hezbollah refuse to stand down on its attacks that had led to Israeli response attacks that had ultimately displaced tens of thousands of people on both sides of the border. That be has, has been an untenable situation for the people of both countries. But ultimately, what we want to see is implementation of United States uh, is of, of UN Security Council Resolution 1701 because that would get us back to a place where those residents can return to their homes. Is there any uh, political engagement, any U.S. official visiting Beirut next week? Do you have any? Uh, I don't have any announcements to make about travel next week. Um, stay tuned. We'll make an announcement as we have them, but I don't have any to announce today. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I just want to also follow up on uh, Hiba's question regarding the, the outcome of this war. We've been saying it uh, on many uh, occasions that the outcome should be the full implementation of 1701. And as the fighting goes on, we see ourselves further away from the, achieving that by military means. I remember when I asked you about Naim Qasim's statement that he is willing to go with Biri, the, the parliament, Lebanese uh, Speaker of the Parliament, that you were saying that, yes, we want it ultimately, but now it's, it's time for Israel to attack Hezbollah. Hezbollah is still fighting, he's still firing missiles, things threatening to go beyond control in southern Lebanon. We've seen yesterday uh, the, uh, uh, the Israeli military just, uh, I don't know what the word to describe that, but a whole village went into nothing at, in southern Lebanon. Do you feel that maybe this approach of you, allowing Israel this window, is actually dragging you more and more into something that you don't really want? So, uh, first of all, as you've heard me say before, and I'm going to repeat it again because I think it's always an important reminder, Israel is a sovereign country that makes its own decisions. And we impress upon them what we believe the best outcome is for their security interests, for the security interests of neighboring countries, for the security interests of the broader broader region. But these are decisions that Israel ultimately makes, um, and we will intervene with them to make clear what we think um, uh, is the outcome that they ought to pursue. When it comes to what happens next, uh, Obviously, we want to see a change in the political situation in Lebanon because we want to see them elect a president. We've made that clear. But the, the, the part of the qu question that I'm having um, a, a little bit of trouble with is it removes any agency from Lebanese political actors and the Lebanese political system and puts it all in the United States. It is ultimately up to the people in Lebanon, the Lebanese government, to break through the dysfunction that has plagued it and elect a new um, uh, uh, president, something that we have made clear, something the international community has made clear that they want to see for some time. It is all up to the Lebanese people to break the stranglehold that Lebanon has had, or, I'm sorry, that Hezbollah has had uh, on the Lebanese <coughs> government. Um, uh, we can uh, do our part, other countries can do our part, but the countries in the region play a role in this too. Lebanon, the Lebanon, Lebanese people play a role in this too. So, um, what we want to see happen is Hezbollah degraded, Hezbollah pull back, Hezbollah finally meet the obligations that they committed to in 2006 and have never fulfilled. It's important to remind people of that because it is an important part of the story of how we got here today. And we're going to continue to work to try to achieve that outcome. About Matt, uh, yeah, Israel is a sovereign state, of course, and can take its own position, but you are providing them with weapons. And you did before put restrictions on countries. Ukraine is an example that you provide them with a military aid in the middle of a war, and you put restrictions and limitation on how they use this military, especially targeting 
uh, inside uh, Russian territory. Why don't you apply the same here with Israel? Uh, every conflict is different. We continue to engage with um, Israel about the need to uh, protect civilians, to minimize civilian harm, and that will continue to be at the center of our policy. M my last question is about a report that came out uh, a couple of hours ago in New York Times, or I saw it a couple of hours ago, maybe it was old. Uh, it's about uh, the Israeli military using uh, uh, captured Palestinians in Gaza as a human shield. And if I want to quote here what the, uh, what the report is saying is that the practice is routine, commonplace, organized, conducted with considerable logistical support and the knowledge of superiors on the battlefield. Uh, the, the detainees were handled and often transported between squads by officers from an Israeli intelligence agencies, which shows, I mean, we've been asking about this before, but it shows here it was more organized, it was more within the knowledge of higher command in Israel, and it's still going on. Do you have any comments? Yeah, I also saw that report, and I can tell you we found it incredibly disturbing. If the facts as presented in that report are true, they're completely unacceptable. They're is no reason, there can be no justification ever for the use of civilians as human shields. It would be a violation not just of international humanitarian law, but of the IDF's own code of conduct. Um, I know that the IDF has announced that they are investigating the claims in that report. That is entirely appropriate for them to do. But even more than investigate, if they do find violations, people need to be held accountable and they need to take steps to ensure that these practices are not repeated. Yeah, yeah thank you, Matt. Uh, I have several questions too. Uh, first, uh, did you get any sense from uh, the Lebanese uh, leaders uh, that you are talking to that they are ready to move forward to elect a new president and to get rid of the Iranian and Hezbollah influence in Lebanon? I'm not going to speak on behalf of the officials inside the Lebanese government that we have engaged with. Obviously, as you know, the Secretary spoke to the Prime Minister on Friday. He spoke to the Speaker of the Parliament on Friday. We've made clear that we believe it is in their interest and in the interest of stability in the region to elect uh, a new president, but I'll let them speak for themselves. And uh, second, uh, on uh, the buffer zone in the south, uh, Israel, uh, it looks like they're planning to establish a buffer zone two kilometers uh, from the border inside Lebanon. Do you support such uh, move? Now, I don't know what you mean by buffer zone. If it means Hezbollah pushing back to be on the Latani River, obviously that's something we support. Um, if it's some kind of uh, uh, other buffer zone, um, uh, for example, if it's a buffer zone that would be occupied by the IDF, that would be something we would oppose. And uh, on, um, on the letter that uh, the secretary is uh, sent to Israel, uh, today, news reports said that Prime Minister Netanyahu convened uh, an emergency discussion uh, on increasing aid to Gaza, and senior Israeli officials said that the aid will be expanded soon. Did you get any uh, response from the, Isra uh, the Israelis in uh, this regard? We have been, uh, we obviously have gotten a response from them. We've been in, co in contact with them about the uh, elements contained in the letter. I will let them speak for themselves, but we have made clear to them that we expect them to take it incredibly seriously. As I said, we have seen in the past few days them take some initial steps, but there's much more that they need to do. And finally, why did you give them 30 days uh, to make them not more, not less? Uh, well, if you look at the, the letter, it says we need to see immediate action, and we have seen immediate action, but we also make clear that there are some of the steps that would take more than three days, four days, seven days. For example, the, the, the ability for people to relocate from Owasi to areas inland before it gets cold, something that you can't do overnight. You have to, have, have, you have to be able to set up places for them to go. You have to have food when they get there. You have to have sanitation facilities. Those aren't the kind of things that can happen um, uh, in a week or a few days. So we thought it was reasonable to give Israel uh, uh, a bit of time to implement those steps that we recommended in the letter, but that there are other things that needed to happen uh, urgently and immediately, which is what we've seen over the past couple of days. And one, one more, if you don't mind, uh, news report said too that the secretary is ready to uh, uh, put forward uh, a plan for uh, post-Gaza war, uh, and the, the deadline would be after the elections. Is this accurate, and do you have a specific plan to uh, 
so to offer. We haven't made any decisions in that regard. We continue to be in consultation with a number of countries in the region. Um, Secretary's been has traveled extensively to talk with partners throughout the region, including Israel, including Arab countries, <laughs> about plans for the post-conflict uh, period in Gaza and how you establish governance, how you how you rebuild Gaza, how you um, reconstruct people's neighborhoods, and how you provide a political path forward. Um, but those those discussions are ongoing. Thank you. Danny, I'm going to skip over you to try to stay in the region. So, Tom. Thank you. Um, come, but I will come back to you. I just to re I wanted to return to Nabatia and the, the mayor who's been killed in the strike, apparently they killed 16 people. Um, I mean, th this is described as a Hezbollah-affiliated mayor. The attack was on a official Lebanese state building. I mean, if there is, if, if that's on the face of it, the reason for this attack that he's Hezbollah affiliated, is that a justifiable target in your view? I don't want to comment on the face of things. I want to be able to comment when I have full verified information, which I don't have at this point. But I'm, I'm asking a question. I mean, you said earlier that Israel has the right to target members of Hezbollah. I mean, would you regard a Hezbollah affiliated mayor of a village as a member of Hezbollah uh, that Israel has the right to target? Again, I... Don't even have confirmation that he's a Hezbollah-affiliated mayor. I'm taking your version of the story. Before I comment on the specifics of a strike or deal with that kind of hypothetical, I would want to know the full particulars, which I don't have at this point. I mean, and the reason I ask the question is just about policy, because obviously a lot of this is using American-supplied arms. So does Israel have the right to target anyone who has an affiliation with Hezbollah? Because this is a group that has a clear military um, side to it and it also is deeply embedded in the state it's the most dominant force in Lebanon it has civil servants it has M MPs would you regard all of those as legitimate targets they have the right to target militants they have the right to target to, to target those engaged in terrorism those involved with supporting terrorism with financing terrorism then helping carry out terrorist terrorist attacks uh, I think that's clear under an international humanitarian law they don't have the right to carry out to carry out attacks on civilians that's also clear okay so that sounds like but uh, but, the, but, it just like I, I, but, but hold on there. I just when you want to get to the next iteration of looking at an individual person have to know the specific facts yeah, about the individual no, I'm person not actually asking you that about an individual person I'm, I'm just asking it's it sounds from what you're saying is that there is a line in the, you know, civil servants or MPs who some countries do not designate the political wing of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, as I think the U.S. does. But it sounds as though you're, you are putting a line there and saying I, I don't um, I, 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 I will not either agree or disagree with your characterization. I'm going to stand on the words that I just outlined okay. and, for myself. And I just but I just want to expand this because I think it does go to what the strategy is here, what your strategy is as the primary military backer of Israel in terms of this operation because you have moved from a strategy just a few weeks ago which was get the residents of Israel back to the north get the residents in Lebanon back to the south basically that was your primary objective and then rolling into that trying to get 1701 you know implemented as part of a, a, a short truce where you could get people talking but you're now way beyond that because you're now in a situation where you're saying, you know, you want a new president elected. You've said you want it's up to the Lebanese people to break the stranglehold that Hezbollah has on the Lebanese government. You weren't saying any of these things a month ago. That is, that is, okay. that is absolutely not true. Okay, That's no, no, so no, just, no, as a, just as a factual matter, we have made clear going back even before. Be oh, just, let me, Tom, just let me yeah. correct the record because it's, it's really important. Yeah. We have made clear going back before October 7th that we wanted to see the Lebanese. Yeah. Parliament break this political deadlock and elect a new president. This is not a position. It's not something new that we are trying to accomplish. But you weren't connecting it to an Israeli military operation, which has invaded Lebanon, which is bombing Beirut. And now these things are wrapped together. So I'm asking you about the strategy for the military campaign that you're the key supplier of, because this sounds like, given what Benjamin Netanyahu has said about, you know, he wants the Lebanese to rise up against Hezbollah, and you're saying break the stranglehold. This is now in the context of a military, military operation. So I'm asking the question, is that the, are you creating these conditions for the Israelis to stop? Okay. That you want, basically, Hezbollah removed as both a military and political force in Lebanon? Of course we want to see Hezbollah not exercise political power inside Lebanon. They're a terrorist organization. They're a terrorist organization so that I'm is held... Hold on, just, Tom, just let, me, let me finish. You had a long build-up to, to the question. Um, they're a terrorist organization that is held the Lebanese people hostage that has killed, murdered 
civilians inside Lebanon. So of course we don't want to see them involved in governance inside Lebanon. And that is not anything new. Just, I see your hand up. Let me just finish. That is not anything new. That has been the policy of the United States going back years and years, decades, in fact. And it has also been the policy of the United States that we want to see them elect a new president going back for some time. Now, we do want to see people return to their homes. We ultimately want to see a diplomatic resolution, but it needs to be a diplomatic resolution that actually will will produce that site hand down for a second. I'll, I'll come to you that will produce that outcome because we saw for the year after October 7th these tit-for-tat attacks going back and forth across the blue line and the result was tens of thousands of people um, being displaced for their homes so we want to see at the end of this military campaign this diplomatic resolution that will get people home yes we also want to see a change in the Lebanese government that means Lebanon can elect a new president. That has been our position for some time. It's not something that new that started when the first Israeli forces crossed the border. But I'm just challenging that because yes, you've always said that about you, you know Lebanon's been in this crisis where it hasn't had a president for two years, and obviously you don't have Hezbollah in Lebanon. But you weren't saying we think the way to do that is to bomb Lebanon into this solution, which no, I did. I have not said that no, no, today. Said so, that. so, so, so just that. to be clear, just to be clear, is, if you to want get, to use words, I'm, use the I'm words that I've you, used. I'm trying to ask you to ask, I'm asking you to disentangle these two things because I'm saying to you, is it a condition of the end of this op military operation in Lebanon that these things are achieved, that there is a new president, uh, that Hezbollah are basically disempowered completely, both militarily and political, because you weren't saying this, the way to achieve that more than four weeks ago, you weren't saying the way to achieve that involved a military campaign. But now we are in a situation where the two things, as far as I can tell, are and bound together. And the, you're not so, distinguishing between so them, as far as I can see. Let me just go back to something that we said immediately after Israel launched this military campaign, which is that we are fully cognizant that military campaigns can at times create space for diplomacy. Long history of that. They can also produce the opposite effect. And we've seen military campaigns in Lebanon where Israel has crossed the border with the intent of a limited campaign, and it has turned to something completely different. And we're aware of the possibility of that scenario as well. I'm not going to make any predictions about what will happen. I'm telling you what we're going to try to achieve. Ultimately, when you come to asking about the military objectives, that's a question for Israel, not for us. I can tell you what it is that we want to see happen, and that's what I've made clear. And I just lastly, I know other people want to come in, but it's just the, the point is, you know, the president said right at the start of all this, don't repeat the mistakes we made after 9-11. You know, we saw what happened in Iraq with the attempt at regime change, and 10 years later you have ISIS. And so I ask this question because critics of what's happening now in Lebanon with the Israeli, the Israeli military campaign is happening will say, well, look, this is just another regime change attempt. And to try and do that through a campaign of bombing has been proven, especially in the Middle East, to be completely futile and counterproductive. So and yeah, you, you seem to be, you know, you're, you're behind this, you know, you're, the, you're in, in with this. Now. We, so we are not interested in regime change. We are interested in the people of Lebanon electing a president and breaking the deadlock that a terrorist organization. I don't know how I could be any more clear than that. That's what we've been interested in for years. It's what we continue to be interested in, continues to be what we, we push for in our diplomatic engagements. Sorry. Thank you, Matt. Uh, first, I'm the aide. You said that we've seen improvement in the last couple of days. Do you have any, can you quantify that? I mean, what are the number of trucks? Yeah, as I said, have? when I was outlining it, 50 trucks came in um, okay. uh, from Jordan yesterday. There were another, I think it was 20 or 30 trucks that came in uh, on Monday into Eris. So we've seen some initial truck deliveries. And we've seen the opening of these other routes that should allow aid to move um, uh, around Gaza more easily and especially move from the south to the north. But the proof is going to be in the pudding. We're going to have to watch and see that all of this isn't just sustained, but that it, that it continues to increase. So uh, the level that you want to see over the next Next 30 days and so on is what like 300 350 it's outlined in the letter 350. okay yeah. all right that's that's good second on the uh, issue that matt uh, raised on the memo you know uh providing israel with 3.8 i guess 3.8 billion dollars a year and so on that was done during the obama administration but let me ask you in principle if a country that you provide aid to breaks the law regardless of what kind of agreement you sign with them couldn't, can't you break away from that agreement and say that they have basically, you know, grossly and uh, fundamentally broken uh, the law or the terms of the agreement? Yeah, we have obligations under, under um, our own laws to ensure that countries that are the recipients of U.S. military assistance don't 
uh, block the delivery of humanitarian assistance, don't impede the delivery of humanitarian assistance, and we take steps to ensure that we enforce that law. We have uh, obligations under U.S. law to ensure that our weapons are used uh, in compliance with our national humanitarian law. So, so in principle, you can declare that agreement to be null and void if it does not fit into your so I, I'm not going to get too far into parsing the law from here, as I'm not a lawyer. But yes, we have the ability to enforce U.S. law, of course. Okay, oh, good. Oh, oh. What? <laughs> what? You really think that you have the ability to declare the null and void the MOU not, that was signed? I did not say null and void. We have the ability. Well, no, to, that's what he said, and you said. I said I'm not, not going to get into it. So I, I, I don't in, think you do. I, I'm not, I think you're oh, walking hold on. a I'm not real get into, fine I, line here. I, if that's what you think, I'm you not going to get into parsing all the provisions of law, including the provisions of law that provide us that requires to provide military assistance, and the provisions of law that requires to ensure that other that that people comply with the Foreign, uh, uh, Foreign Assistance well, Act you need to requirement, rule in or rule it requirements. Out because if you because no, we, so it could this be goes somewhere back, in this, the middle. This goes then. back to the conversation that you and I had at the beginning of this, which yeah, I know. Yeah, I know, but you just, you just, no, but you just left the door open to you saying that you could declare, that the administration could declare the MOU that was signed that, in, I, I did, took effect I, in 2019 I, I, so I very and much, is valid until I, 2028 I could be declared very, null and void. I very much did not, I don't, so okay. you should never, I don't think that's correct, I, but that's what you implied. That is not at all what I implied or said. Okay, thank you. Let me just continue also on the issue that Ahmed raised on the human shields and so on. I, I know you've always accused uh, the Palestinian group or even Hezbollah of using civilians as a human shield, but you declare them as terrorists. Would you declare the Israeli army as a terrorist organization? No, the Israeli uh, army is not a terrorist organization. Okay, so they're not it's a ridiculous. terrorist organization, but they, they continue. Let me, please, just let me finish on this. And so we, we see this happen time and again. This is a practice that's been conducted by the Israelis in the West Bank for a very, very long time. So how would you, how would you reach a conclusion in the end? Because Israel could investigate itself. It has done that. Uh, time and time again, but we never really see the results. They never are held accountable uh, to anything when they say, yeah, we have done this and this is wrong. So what would be the consequence? Uh, so we want to see them fully investigate, investigate, and if appropriate, hold people accountable. If there are people who have committed violations of the IDF code of conduct, they need to be held uh, accountable under Israel's military justice system. If there are people that uh, have, viol may have violated international humanitarian law, they need to be uh, held accountable. If we see people, um, violations of the laws of war of international humanitarian law we have procedures uh, that we look at as well and one uh, couple you know one, one thing on Aisha Noor the American that was killed you know more than a, uh, a month ago the activist the, the activist American her family are demanding justice have you heard from the Israelis on this issue? How long will it take? We, so we have been uh, in contact with them, including in the recent in the uh, recent days, about the status of this investigation. My understanding is that it is that it is ongoing. We have made clear to them, including recently, that we want to see it completed as soon as possible. All right, I'm going to try to go to somebody outside. Hold on, just I'll go to Kylie, and then we're 45 minutes in. I haven't gotten to anything else, and so Kylie, go ahead. And then I'm going to try to go to some other questions. When it comes to the changes you want to see in the Lebanese government, uh, presidential elections, do you think that Lebanon is any closer to actually carrying out those elections today than they were a few weeks ago before the U.S. was really pushing hard on this? I don't, I don't have an assessment to offer from here. That's something that, the, that members of the Lebanese political system need to speak to. Okay. And then one other question. Um, there's a report that the secretary is considering laying out the day after plan for Gaza after the presidential elections in November. Um, is that accurate? Is he is he planning to roll that out after um, the elections? So I did speak this to this in response to someone uh, someone else's question. Um, I don't have any announcements to make about a plan. Um, it's something that we continue to discuss with a number of countries in the region, our Arab partners, uh, uh, Israeli partners as well, about what the specific contours of a plan would look like. As you know, this is something we've been working on uh, going back months. But as to um, when we would have something to present um, with our counterparts in the region, I don't have a timeline. Would there Are there any conditions on the ground that would need to be in place in order for such a plan to be presented? So I just don't want to get into the what the plan what a plan might look like. Obviously, you know the the relevant pillars of such a plan because you've heard the secretary speak about them publicly: governance, reconstruction. Um, but I don't want to get into any further details here. It's something that we're in, in active, ongoing discussions about. 
All right, Alex, I'm going to go. I'm going to uh, just because I've only got 10 minutes left. I'm going to try so to get some I other know questions before we break. You would back to me the list again. Jan, 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 Very quickly, uh, was the secretary part of the phone call today uh, that took place between the president and President Zelensky? Uh, I, I, um, he was over at the White House earlier. I don't know if he joined the call or not. The President Zelensky today, uh, as you know, spoke and he uh, presented his victory plan. You last week commented on a plan, so you told us that we reviewed the plan, we saw some number of productive steps. Can you help us now that we know what you knew back then? Can you please help us decode it a little bit? What do you support, what you don't support? No, I'm not going to get into the, the various details other than to say that we uh, continue to engage with the government of Ukraine about that plan. Um, obviously, the president spoke to President Zelensky about it today. I'm sure that that was a, uh, one of the topics of, of conversation. And we continue to work with them about other measures that aren't included in the plan that we believe would position uh, uh, Ukraine to win on the bat battlefield and ensure a just and lasting peace. The concerns of France and Germany, they have been scaling down their military support to Ukraine. Do you have any, do you share those, those uh, Every country has to make its own decisions based on their capabilities, based on their budgets, about what they can do. We have been gratified by the coalition of more than 50 countries we have put together to support Ukraine. We've seen a number of countries, not just inside Europe, but outside Europe, who have contributed to Ukraine's defense, and we're confident that that support will continue. Thank you. And final one from Moldova, you know, there will be, be election this, this uh, weekend. Uh, their concerns are Russia. Uh, might have been sabotaging the process. You know, the disinformation campaign. You know, uh, do you share those concerns and what are you going to do about it? Of course we do. My colleague, uh, John Kirby at the White House, laid out some new information yesterday. I don't have anything to add to that. Jenny, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, two questions on Russia and China and North Korea. The Russia and North Korea mutual military cooperation treaty has been submitted as a bill to the Russian House of Representatives for ratification. This will legalize military cooperation between the North Korea and Russia. It also seems to justify the dispatch of North Korean troops to Russia's war in Ukraine. What do you think about this? Uh, we continue to have great concerns about the uh, growing security relationship between uh, Russia and North Korea. And the second question, the defense ministers of Russia and China met in Beijing and reaffirmed the military cooperation between the two countries. What concerns do you have about substantial military cooperation between China and Russia. We've spoken that to before, and I don't have anything new to add to it today. Thank you so Go ahead. much. Yeah. Alba, in light of in Bangladesh, in light of uh, the Home Ministry of Bangladesh embargo on prosecution individuals involved in the action during the anti-Hasina movement up to August 8th, and reports that between August 5th, after Sheikh Hasina departure, and August 8th, over 3,000 police officers were killed. More than 400 police station abolished, and many our milig members targeted by organized protesters under coordinated plan described as by Dr. Muhammad Yunus. Will the U.S. administration ask the Bangladesh government to ensure justice for all victims, irrespective? Of political affiliation? We have made clear that um, there's no excuse for violence either conducted against those conducting peaceful protests or conducted uh, by those protesting. Uh, and anyone that's responsible for, for violence should be held accountable. And there are reports that followers of the outlet Hizbut Tahir and Jamaat Islami sang Islamic song and even forced to recitation of Quranic verses on the Durga Puja goddess stage during Bangladeshi largest Hindu festival. How does the U.S. administration view this incident? And will it engage with Bangladesh government to ensure the protection of religious freedom and the rights of minority communities in Bangladesh and around? Uh, obviously, we are committed to religious freedom in Bangladesh and elsewhere. With regards to that specific incident, I'll take it back. Do you have any you, particular you answer. answer for that? That's, that's that. what I'll take it back and get oh, you Thank you. Go ahead. Can I ask you about the meeting that you had with the Indian Environmental Sure. So we, um, uh, the meeting that occurred yesterday, we updated, we being the, the U.S. government broadly, uh, updated uh, mem members of the Committee of Inquiry about the investigation that the United States has been conducting. We've received an update from them on the investigation that they have been conducting. It was a productive meeting, and I will uh, leave it at that. 
did they also inform you about some of the actions they might have taken? Uh, they did inform us that the um, uh, individual who was named in the Justice Department indictment is no longer uh, an employee of the Indian government. Uh, are you satisfied with the cooperation with the Indian government? Uh, we, uh, uh, we are satisfied with the cooperation. We continue, it continues to be an ongoing process. We continue to work with them on that, but we do appreciate the cooperation and we appreciate them updating us, us on their investigation as we update them on ours. And do you see further meetings with them? Uh, I don't have anything to announce today. Yes, my, my question is on Mexico. Last week, the new Mexican president announced restrictions on the U.S. ambassador in Mexico City, preventing him to have direct contact with members of her administration without informing the foreign ministry first. Will you apply reciprocal restrictions to the Mexican ambassador here in Washington? And do you consider these new restrictions adequate? We have a close partnership with the government of Mexico. We um, uh, have a close partnership with the uh, new president of Mexico. We look forward to, um, uh, to working with her and her administration. The ambassador looks forward to working with her uh, and the administration. We look forward to a long continued partnership. So no restrictions on the Mexican ambassador mm -hmm. similar to them? Nothing that I have to announce today. Matt, thank you. Uh, yesterday you said that you should look at your record in Gaza. Since May there has been a decrease in the food aid that's gone in despite America saying that they need the Israelis to do more. Uh, it's now estimated that 2.2 million people are either facing famine or food insecurity. Add to that the fact that from the podium yesterday you described as horrendous the attack on a hospital by Israel and the United States continues to send weapons to Israel. What are you proud about? about what the so if you look States at our done. if you look at our record if you if you listen to my full presentation yesterday you would have heard I said our interventions with the government of Israel started in the days immediately after October 7th to make sure that humanitarian assistance got in. And we saw them let the first trucks come in through Rafa. We then intervened with them to get Karim Shalom open, to get Erez open, to get the route open so humanitarian assistance from Jordan could come in. Now, there have been times when assistance has decreased, when it has stagnated, and when that's happened, we've intervened again to make sure it returns the levels it needs to be. That's what we are doing now, and we're going to watch and see what happens and monitor the results closely. Sorry, Gaffney, want to follow up on that? Just follow up on that, please, Gaffney, Matt. No, Gaffney, go ahead. Uh, yeah, on the case of Mekdara, the journalist arrested in Cambodia, you previously said the U.S. has raised concerns over his arrest with the Cambodian government. Have you had any other engagements since then? Has there been any progress? We have engaged uh, with them uh, at a number of different levels and made clear our concerns and called for his release. Has there been any progress? No, I don't have anything further to announce from the podium today. And then, sorry, just quickly yeah. on UNIFIL. Um, it's come out during the briefing that uh, UNIFIL said Israeli, an Israeli tank fired at, peace, at a peacekeeper's watchtower and damaged it saying yet again we see direct and apparently deliberate fire on a UNIFIL position. Is the U.S. considering any consequences for Israeli attacks on UNIFIL? You warned pretty clearly you did not want to see those taking place. So first of all, just let me say I have had a blanket practice from my first day that I'm not going to comment on things that happen while I'm at the podium, because I obviously haven't seen the, the, the full context of them, uh, other than what's presented to me in a question. But we have made quite clear to the government of Israel that UNIFIL soldiers need to be protected. They're there to uh, fulfill an important mission and that attacks on them are unacceptable. Do you see any indication that they are heeding those warnings? Uh, so I can't speak to this specific attack. We made clear what we, um, uh, what we believe and that attacks are unacceptable. Go ahead. Okay. Is it me? I, have, uh, I have a question related to China and the one uh, related to Gaza. Related to us is like kind of fundamental question. Like you said uh, multiple times to Mr. Said that you are two sovereign, uh, sovereign country, like you and uh, uh, Israel. Uh, but it seems like you have given Israel kind of an special uh, uh, act, and you say that you have interest and they have interest. What is the USA interest in the Middle East in terms of this special dealing, high, uh, high protection for Israel? They have all advantage more any other country around it. So what is the U.S. interest in the Middle East uh, in context of this uh, war? And if you can debate to this. So uh, broadly, concept. we want to see peace and stability in the Middle East, a region that has um, uh, had a lack of stability for decades now. When it comes to Israel, you have a state that has a terrorist organization in Hamas committed to its destruction, that has a terrorist organization in the north in Hezbollah that's committed to its destruction has another state, Iran, that is committed to its destruction and proves that every day by funding these terrorist organizations. So we are committed to the defense of our fellow democracy, Israel, in the face of 
these threats to uh, the state of Israel and to Israeli civilians. And broadly, we want to see peace and stability. And that's what we uh, try to work for with our partners in the region. Okay, second second question. China like has started like kind of military training and uh, maneuvering around Taiwan um, like these days. Uh, do you have any concern as you are fully involved in the Middle East, like Israel consumed most of, like not most, like, but many of your weapons and like military Things. Do you have any concern that China can take advantage of that and like have any operation toward Taiwan? Do you have any concern or reports? That so that? I, I would say that we have made quite clear to China that we oppose any changes to the status quo when it comes to uh, Taiwan, uh, and we've expressed our concern about their uh, engagements um, in that regard, including in, in recent days. But while I know questions about the Middle East tend to dominate the briefing.